I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, I'm George Lewis. I'm a professor of music at the University of California, San Diego, right here at UCSD. And we're here to talk about creativity, not just in the arts, but in general, creativity in life, so to speak, and how we can all foster our own creativity in everyday life and in whatever kinds of, whatever kinds of pursuits we're involved with. So for that purpose, I'm happy to have my great colleague here, Professor Cecil Lytle, who is also a professor of music at UCSD and also the provost of Thurgood Marshall College and an extremely accomplished and widely traveled concert pianist who works in a variety of styles. So I, could you welcome Professor Lytle, would you mind? <laughs> now, I have played music with Professor Lytle. I'm a trombonist myself by trade. and. Um, I've noticed that Professor Lytle has a very unusual background in music that I thought it might be interesting to hear about from him if you'd like to talk about that. I mean, how did you get started in this? Well, I, I don't remember, remember ever getting started in music. I, uh, my father was a Baptist church organist, and whenever he played the piano, from my early childhood, I remember he would play the organ, and I would sit next to him at the piano, and I'd play with the palms of my hands, just and yelling and screaming, and sing. I thought it was singing, <laughs> yelling and screaming, uh, trying to keep up with the choir. So I don't remember ever properly beginning to take piano. It just sort of was something that happened in the family. And I'm the last of 10 kids, so all of the children either sang or played an instrument, trombone. Reggie played trombone, too. Really? Yeah. Oh. In the bathroom. We made him play in the bathroom. Oh, that's where I played. Yeah. I remember that. It has a great sound. It does. He liked it, too. <laughs> I mean, nowadays they don't. They're but I, I think I grew up in a house that had a lot of music making, and we made music on our own, or made it in context of the church, a Baptist church, gospel music. Uh, so I, it wasn't really until I was about eight or nine that I took proper lessons. And I really think those first three or four years were the formative years, because I sort of had to ingest music through my ears and eyes, because the choir sang right in front of me as I played the piano. Or, or, and so I had to sort of figure out music with, through Sister Gladys Thornton, who was singing Precious Lord every Sunday morning. <laughs> so I sort of figured out that whenever she got to the point, a certain point in the song, she was sort of by the E of Kanabi, which was the written name of the piano. And I would sort of go to that point. And when she sang another phrase, I would go to another position on the piano. I didn't know about keys or, or rhythms or things. I was sort of learning this on the fly. And as I learned more about music, so I learned to read music in the early teens, uh, uh, early adolescence, I started to connect up what I was hearing, improvising as an improvised music, and what I was learning as a printed music, and tried to reconcile those two. And I think I've spent the last 40 years trying to reconcile what I hear intuitively, what I feel and sense intuitively, and what I read. Well, okay. that's interesting. You say you heard it before you played it. Is that the idea? Right, right. And you're hearing it all the time, even when you're not playing it? And there's so many other sources for hearing it, right? Uh, absolutely. And I, when I say rec trying to reconcile, is that I think when I play classical music, uh, Beethoven or, or whatever, I try to approach it as, as a composer would, not as a replicator. Meaning, if I wrote that piece, or if I'm indeed writing that piece at the moment I'm playing it, w what, if, that is, if I could replace Sister Gladys Thornton for a little bit on Beethoven, how would she sing it? Or how would I, uh, I would want to bring something new to that piece? How would I inject all of what I intuitively sense about music into a piece that may be 150 years old on a piece of paper. Uh, so my approach is not so much as a replicator as much as a getting, trying to get into the head of the person who threw those notes on the page. What was he or she thinking about? So how do you do that? How do you, well let me take it back a step. Now when you listen to music on the radio, like let's say you're listening to a hip-hop piece or something, do you often think about you know, what was that person thinking when they made that? Yeah, I, well, I think yeah. all of us do. I mean, we may not articulate uh, precisely uh, you know, the ethos of what was on that individual's mind, but we try to in read our own story into someone else's music. We do it all the time. Hmm. And, uh, and hip hop's a very good example because it is about story, it is narrative. It's, uh, it's a poet, it's poetic. I think Stevie Wonder, pre-hip-hop, I think Stevie Wonder ought to, ought to win a Pulitzer Prize for, for literature. I mean, you can just separate his, his narrative from the wonderful music he's written. And I think hip-hop is an extension of that. It is an expression of an individual story, and if you hear 20, 25 hip-hop artists, and you hear a collective story or a collective ideology being expressed. And I don't think that's very different than what Beethoven was trying to do. And I know that's heresy, George. Not but at I think all. there's a fact, narrative in all the music. <laughs> You were going to say that? I was going to, no, I think I'm totally <laughs> in agreement with that. But why is that considered heresy? 
I think because the tradition of you, at least what was taught to me at the conservatories, and I think to you in the music departments and, uh, that we've gone to and now teach at, is that, that there isn't a narrative in music, that it is uh, the printed page and mm. that is the only truth. And I, I think because uh, my view of music is that it's all narrative, is that I think the performer has an, something to bring to that narrative to play the interesting pieces. And I think pieces I play are ones that are the really pieces that are at the margins. Uh, you mentioned earlier a concert of Beethoven I played a few years ago here. And it was late Beethoven. It's the more odd Beethoven sonnets, the ones that are on the margins of his imagination. People here listen to Beethoven never? Uh-oh. You did? Yeah, you did? A couple of people? Well, you know, I was just going to say that it might be interesting because we're sort of, you know, do you think you have anything available in that area? Because sure. Your, your sure. vast repertoire. Because you memorize a lot of these things. Right? I, I try to. In fact, I'm memorizing a new piece of yours today. So oh, yeah. And then you right. started adding these parts, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> but if you could sort of show us a little bit about how you do these things, how you sort of imbue that. Because a lot, a lot of the, a lot of people who haven't listened to it, maybe they haven't listened to it because they think it's it's hard or it sounds funny or you've been told that it's something you're supposed to listen to because it's good for you and that really has nothing to do with music. It's, it's, uh, there's a sort of an ecstatic emotional experience that you can get from listening to any kind of music. And then this idea about how you are putting your own personality, your own creativity into it. I wonder how you do that. Well, let me give you maybe an example. I can, I'll give you an example. There's a piece I've been playing recently it's a very long piece. I'm just going to play a fragment of it by Franz Liszt. You've heard the name, the composer Franz Liszt? It's a very odd spelling, L-I-S-Z-T, Hungarian. Uh, and this is a piece that is at the margin of his writing, meaning it's very rarely played because it is difficult to follow. I'm going to give you a, a little cue about how to follow it. In its totality, it's about 35 minutes long. But I'm going to play about uh, two or three minutes of it, a little fragment of it and give you a sense of how I, I think Franz Liszt was thinking. And then I'm going to ask you some questions about how do you think he's thinking, or more importantly, how do you listen to it? How do you, you participate in this piece? Here's the key. This piece in its totality is about 30 odd minutes long. And he builds this long half hour piece on one theme. So it has this kind of almost monotonous referral to this, this tune, this kind of a, um, motive that keeps re reoccurring. He puts it in one particular kind of format and immediately goes to another, transforms it into another format. The theme may appear in the right hand, may appear in the left hand, may be in major, may be in minor, may be in three-quarter time, may be in four-quarter time, <coughs> different sorts of settings. So in a sense, his narrative is a kind of like a mantra almost. Uh, it is a kind of a subtext for the, what we hear as the overall <coughs> uh, musical expression. But it has this kind of a mantra, this kind of an individual uh, motive or narrative. And it's repeated over and over. It's repeated and over. over and over, and there's nothing new except the setting in which it appears. Let me give you an example. Again, the piece is entitled um, The Odd Nos, A-D-N-O-S, Fantasy. And it's, uh, as I said, about a half hour in totality. But here's about two or three minutes of it. And it begins with what I think is the extreme of this kind of, of uh, mantra, and that is it begins with a fugue. You know what a fugue is? It's imitation writing. That is one theme, let's say maybe uh, a trombone could play it, is then followed by an, the, uh, another statement of that theme, and they sort of go in parallel to one another. This fugue has three statements, three voices of this theme. And here's what the theme sounds like. That's it. That's the totality of the music that Liszt uses to germinate, uh, germinate this half-hour piece. And the fugue has, is based on this idea of having themes following right after that. And it's all, they, each one is based on that same tune. So I'm going to play a couple minutes of it just to give you a sense of how Franz Liszt is thinking about his compositions. And then I'm going to ask you some questions about it.
that's, <laughs> that's the opening of this fugue. What, uh, what's your, how do you react to that? What do you, yes? It's like, because when you first played that little hook at the first part, I noticed through the song, like, it kind of played repetitive. It kept, the little hook kept showing up when you didn't expect it to, like, all through the keys when you were going up and down the keys, that little, da -da -da -da, it kept showing up again and again. It kept showing up. That thing, that da 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 yeah, da da that little yeah. dotted. That's a nice word, that little hook. Yeah, right? that's, a, yeah, that's a nice word. Well, you know, it's the new generation. Yeah. They didn't have hooks in this time. James they Baldwin called them talked, something else. James Baldwin talked about the hook when he was writing a piece. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes he called it the gimmick, but it's like a, a device, a narrative, a little thing that propels a, his writing forward. Um, the da 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 Around you, that 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 hook was kind of like a round. What, what does he mean by around? It kept on showing up like when um, you play one part, you play it again, like halfway through it, and then you play it again, past, halfway through that, and it keeps on going again and again. Right, right. So you two are sort of saying the same thing. There's a hook. There's something. That little theme, that da 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 theme, keeps coming back and back. Row, row, row your boat. Kind of. Everybody can sing that. Well, the thing is that here's what I, I had a question for, about these kinds of things is that you said you were getting into the mind <laughs> of the composer, which is almost has a spiritual quality to it. And, and the thing is about Franz Liszt and a lot of composers of, of his in the earlier generations, including Beethoven, including um, Bach, including Mozart, is that it was expected of the performer to improvise. In fact, I believe that Liszt was probably the last generation of, com of, of composers and pianists who were expected to improvise. And Liszt, in addition to being a great composer, was a virtuoso pianist like Cecil. And so what, what I'm just asking is that do you hear something of that impro improvisative spirit in what he's doing in, in a piece like this? Absolutely. I think this, these kinds of pieces uh, are particularly I think the score, the printed page of this music, uh, bear, doesn't bear the same relationship to the sonic reality as scores of other composers, meaning he wrote notes down. In a sense, that score is a frozen snapshot of what he was thinking Tuesday, April 13th, uh, 1852, or whatever date it was. Um, but it, it's not fixed. Had he lived longer or had he returned to that piece, it probably would have changed. And I don't think we should look at those notes as being religious. Yes, I want to play the right notes, but I think how I play them is a question of how I might bring some different integrity to, uh, to that score and to, and to see whether that certain set of notes ought to be louder, softer, slower, faster. Some of them I choose not to play uh, quite as prominent because uh, I think it is an improvisation that was frozen in time because it was commerce, he wanted to make money, he wanted to sell it to someone else to uh, buy the music. But uh, these pieces in particular are generated out of a, an imagination that was always changing. See, out of an imagination, and things are changing all the time. Now, this, so that there was a sense where he did entire concerts that were improvised. <coughs> now, I'll give you an idea of an improvisation. Okay, you walk out in the middle of the street, and you look and you see a car is coming. You've got to get out the way. But just a decision you have to make right then. So what are you going to do? Are you going to go to the left? Are you going to go to the right? Are you going to like freeze and get hit? What are you going to do? That's an improvisation. In other words, you're making decisions in response to the moment based upon what you know about life. So that essentially, there's not a great deal of difference between what people are doing when they're improvising music, <coughs> like the way, you know, or what they're doing when they're sort of crossing the street or playing a video game where if I don't make this move, I might get killed. Or, or whatever is going to happen. So those are all examples of improvisation. And we improvise, through, I think, throughout most of our lives, on pretty much on a daily basis. Our everyday conversations are not written out in advance by anybody. You know, we might say, well, how you doing, or yo, or whatever people say nowadays. But the point is that after that, it's open. You don't know what people are going to say, and so you don't know what you're going to say back. All that's got to be made up on the spot based on your knowledge and based on your history and based on your story of who you are. So that's really about the same as you can do that in any field. It doesn't matter whether it, we're doing it in music. could be something else. could be whatever you do. I think this young lady's point of the hook, or the, maybe yours too, of the round, that there could be some kind of a, 
uh, narrative that you're working on. I'm sure many of you have written poetry or you've rapped. Uh, you've made up uh, an expression, and you may have started with a germ of an idea, and it took you places you didn't think you were going to wind up at. Uh, I mean, have you, it, who raps? I mean, all right, all right. Who has written poetry? Written or recite poetry? Oh, there we go. See, there it is. Yeah, now, what's the difference between poetry and rap? I mean, what, like, give me an oh, example. Who would, who would say, that, I mean, what, uh, what, what started you writing poetry? Did you have an idea and expressing a, a point? And did you know that you were, that last line was going to be like that when you got to it? Did you change it the next day? I mean, what was in your mind when you create? It's hard to talk about what's in your mind. Go ahead and tell us. Do you write poems? How do you think about angry moments, feelings? Angry moments. Angry moments. So would you call that your hook? That was the, the device that got you started. And what was your feeling? Did you write it out or did you just say it? Or did you rap it or say it over and over? Just write it down. And did you know where you were going with it? Or how did, how did you know when you were done? When, when I say it. Well, you know, you can, the thing is that creativity, I don't think it's really limited to the arts, you know, poetry, dance, music, theater, you know, you're going to find it in everything that you do. You'll find it in math or science or you'll find it in and driving a car a particularly interesting way. In other words, the idea is that no matter what you're doing, creativity is something that's really our birthright. We, we don't have to, um, it's not handed to us and can't be taught. And everyone gets to do it from the beginning. There isn't anyone who can't be creative or who isn't creative. That's just not possible. You know, you're creating yourself at every moment. Um, the thing I wanted to ask you about Cecil was something about because you played all kinds of music you played you you were trained in a lot of different kinds of ways of thinking about music I mean talking about your early early hearing of, of Baptist Baptist preachers and early church music and you've played I don't even want to talk about leaves those labels anymore but all kinds of things but you've played music in which improvisation plays a much larger role mm. well I, I guess that's what I, I, I meant by saying I they are constantly colliding for me and I think uh, even learning a new piece of classical music, new to me at any rate, or even learning your piece. Uh, mm. uh, George Lewis has a new piece entitled Endless Shout that I'm going to be performing uh, the next few months, I guess. And I, it's on a printed page, but I know George Lewis. I know that he, he would like me to bring something to this piece, not change it and alter his hook. Mm -hmm. or his, his, his round, the, the device, the intellectual or emotional device that got the piece, uh, ge generated the piece. But I think he would, he would be resentful if I tried to play exactly what was on the page, precisely mathematically correct, without bringing anything of, of me to it. So I think what we try to do is, is to mitigate our creativity. He gives me a series of ideas, they're on a page, and he says, what do you think about it? <laughs> yeah. uh, can, you, can you play this? And all, not only that, can you play more than this? Can you, and I, he doesn't mean more notes, but he means more uh, input in terms of what I think, how fast it ought to be, or do, do I have an interesting idea about how a certain phrase ought to be played? And that's a challenge. That is an enormous challenge. I mean, with independence comes enormous responsibilities to not only recreate his hook, but to identify and share mine. And that's something, that's called collaboration. And it's enormously challenging. I don't want you to walk out thinking that improvisation means you are independent of responsibilities. Uh, if anything, your responsibilities are even greater in a creative process. But if, if you're an improviser, and we all are, that means that you have to be ready to improvise at any moment. So do you think you could improvise something sure. at any moment? Sure. At this moment, even? At, at this moment, I'd, I'd love, <laughs> to. love to. Actually, <coughs> Sort of this I idea of collaboration uh, stems in all music, and I was just reminded as we were preparing for this program of um, when I was a little younger than you folks, I used to put my ear right up against the uh, speaker uh, to listen to Bud Powell recordings. And I, and I was trying to hear the notes. Yeah, I wanted to try and replicate the notes, but I also wanted to hear the sound. How did he pedal? What, how did he grunt? And what was the noises, other things that, that were going on when he made, made uh, music? Uh, and that was the, sort of the ineffable part to try and capture, because all it was, in his case, was a purely an improvisation. 
And what I wanted to hear was not just the notes, but what was the, as this young lady says, what was the hook behind it? Uh, just maybe I'll give you a taste of something that interests me. Uh, mm. See if you can guess this. See if you know who might have written this, who might have created this hook. got into music. music. <laughs> That's uh, one of America's <laughs> national anthems. It's a, a hook by a, a man named John Coltrane entitled Giant Steps. Do you have any sense for how his hook, how could you describe his hook and compare it with Franz Liszt, his hook? I say they're both improvisations. One got frozen. Well, in fact, that one got frozen. You just heard it. It's in your memory. But what were you thinking about while you were doing it? Because you have heard many different versions of this piece by Coltrane. And I would suggest that you all go out and listen to that, but mm -hmm. to get your own idea of what the possibilities are. But, but in your case, you're sort of doing all this stuff, and you sort of, it's all very different. And you went through about four or five different variations of it in like a minute. And so how do you, what are you thinking about when all that happens? I, you know, I, I, you know, whenever I play that tune, I always have a picture of the first time I saw John Coltrane play. Oh. And it's just an image of his energy. <clears throat> and it wasn't a particularly good afternoon. It was an afternoon, as it turned out. And it wasn't, and I was told later that it wasn't a good afternoon. I mean, he wasn't on, he wasn't hot. But I, you know, just staring at his face, and I sort of was staring up this direction. And you had, you had this enormous sense that this man was thinking the entire time. His eyes were closed most of the time he was playing. Um, but this enormous intellectual power that was going on, because he was searching. He, was, he knew the tune he was playing very well. I can't remember even what the tune was. But he was constantly trying to invent new ways to say the same thing. And while I heard the notes, I heard the rest of the band, I saw the sweat, the smoke, the cigarette smoke, the, the whole environment that, that the music was being created. And I just walked away from that afternoon with a sense of the labor it takes to make music. And that it was this enormous, if I could have somehow cracked his head open and, and heard that conversation that was going on in that was generating all this powerful music, <clears throat> it would have been something on a, akin to a, mu a miracle. Because there was always this sense that this enormous uh, thinking was taking place to uh, make this piece fresh and new each time. I don't know if uh, well, what is, his head. There's so much that you could think about. It, uh, it sort of gives me an idea of what you were thinking about at that time. But is what I what I'm wondering about, and this is something we may not have all may not have that much time to explore. It's just something I wanted you all to think about. Is that when people are doing creative things, they take place at many levels of thought. And you might, be think, you might be surprised to find that while you're practicing your piano, you're thinking about something else you have to do later. You think, or while you're writing your poetry, suddenly another thought comes in about, well, I'm not really concentrating. Or certainly while you're doing some other kind of work, 
you're thinking about something else. That's because we operate on many levels of thought. And so the, the curious thing about this for me, the interesting thing about this for me is that you have this sort of dual heritage. In other words, your knowledge of European musical culture, your knowledge of African American musical culture, all came together in that short improvisation to kind of produce this multicultural, multi-stylistic improvisation that could encompass the entire world, perhaps, in a over a period of years. I, th I think it all. I think all music is generated out of the same kind of id. Uh, what Liszt may have been thinking about in that short example was you know, a hook. It was an idea. I'm not sure what it was exactly. Uh, and certainly John Coltrane in this example, or my example, playing this, there's a kind of an ethic, as an idea I'm trying to communicate. And I think it all is tied together. I do not approach classical music from the point of view of trying to replicate, trying to, trying to do exactly, or even the John Coltrane composition. I think the idea is what is it that I can bring to this moment <coughs> we have together, whether it's one minute or an hour, an hour and a half. And what are the various hooks that might be in part of my personality, my marriage, my musical training, how I feel that day, uh, whether I had a cold last week. And all of that gets played, all of that gets wrapped, all of that gets written in, in whatever expression you might have. So the idea is that no matter what you're doing, the creativity there consists in basically looking inside yourself and making sure that whatever you've got inside yourself, you let that out. I, don't, I think that can happen everywhere. Um, I think we have to go, but I'd like to ask everyone to thank Professor Cecil Lytle for doing those amazing things and talking to us. Thank you.